terribly confused at the wedding. Do you know this one? She got really confused at the wedding rehearsal, going through it all, running through it all. And uh, I think it was the vicar. The vicar said to her, look, it's perfectly straightforward, right? All you've got to remember, you've just got to make a good start. You sort out the beginning, the rest will just follow. We'll look after you. But you've got to get, you know, get this sorted. Okay? You walk up the aisle, you stand in front of the altar, and you sing a hymn. Then I'll take you on from there, be alright. Walk up the aisle, stand at the altar, sing a hymn. And she was overheard coming in at the wedding march saying to herself, I'll alter him. I'll alter him. I'll alter him. Right? Now, that's not a good way to start a marriage, is it? That's not a good way to start a married life. We want to be loved as we are, you know? <laughs> Ladies, you, know, you are a marvellous counterbalance. You're a great help to us, okay? And by the way, that's mutual. Uh, but, uh, but the thing is this, that's not the way to go about things. We want to be loved as we are. So, this is the second in our series about pe why people actually object to coming to Christ. And it's pretty obvious we're worried about, you know, he's going to alter us. People really object deep in their hearts, perhaps, on that basis. So the first two objections in our series relate to issues that people have with God. Firstly, <coughs> Uh, looking at last week, uh, that whole issue, um, <coughs> kind of around cleverly we put it now, John 6, 28, wasn't it? Um, what was it about? It's completely gone. You, won't, you, you, uh, you asked me to trust you, but I'm in control for it, yeah? That's it. Uh, that's how the little title went. And this week we're looking at um, this other one. You know, you want me to change, but I want to be loved as I am. Well, the Book of Romans has got a bottom line response to that, and it goes like this. And who read it? Emily, was it? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We spent a lot of time in the last 20 years in the church talking about what's true and proper worship. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You want me to change, but I want to be loved, loved as I am? The bottom line response of the book of Romans, that objection is simple. You jolly well have been infinitely loved exactly as you are. You have been. Why we're still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Right? You have been loved like that. But the personal experience of that love itself affects deep personal change in somebody who's been touched by that love. So, we're going to look at how Romans unpacks that love of God, who it comes to and how, and then we're going to look at how that love impacts issues of conformity and transformation and renewal of life. And then finally, we'll look at how that entire process puts you in harmony with the universe. So first of all, Let's look at what primary change of heart and life it is that God is actually asking for. Because we get scared about what he is asking for. This is what he's actually asking for. He's fundamentally asking for appropriate, proper, it's only right after all worship. Now how can that hurt? If it's only right after all? How can that hurt? What Paul has been using to stimulate that worship is, is, is there in, in the book of Romans. See from the colours on the screen there, I've used that golden therefore. Right? Therefore, I urge you brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What's Paul saying? He's saying worship. Therefore, worship. Therefore, because of all that's just been spoken about, worship. It's not going to hurt, is it? <laughs> the actual change, the fundamental, most basic change that God is actually looking for isn't nasty or arduous so much as worshipful. Worship not demanded of unwilling people but worship inspired by the previous things Paul has been writing about in Romans. That's why he says therefore. Am I making a meal of this? Look, what am I looking for? What's the change? Worship. That's a change. People don't naturally worship God, do they? And worship God on the basis, he says, of what's just happened. What's just happened in Romans? There's a reason for that golden therefore. Fundamental change of worship. Wherefore the therefore. Oh, what about that? <coughs> Therefore's there for a reason. What's the wherefore of the therefore? Therefore, on the basis of what I've said, what have I just said? 
One, we've been reading Romans for many years, some people, what's Romans about? Have we done this before? Yes, Simon. I remember you did it, but I can't remember what you said. That's the way it goes, isn't it? Got to do it again then. There was a guy, guy a Latin American pastor with a huge church. And he turned he was the new pastor, and he turned out to preach at this church. And uh, he preached a sermon and the next week. People were a little bit confused because the next week he turned up and he preached the same sermon again. And then the third week he came along and preached again and they Thought, the deacons thought they ought to have a word, you know, it's the same, it's the same sermon <laughs> three weeks, like, you know. So they went along and they said, um, <clears throat> Pastor, Pastor Ortiz, it's a very, very fine sermon. They were, they were respectful of their preachers over there. Very, very fine sermon. And, uh, and uh, but you know, it seems quite similar to it. <laughs> yes, he said, when you start doing it, I'll stop preaching it. I do that ever. I have not courage to say anything like that. But, but isn't that amazing? You can do it again. Ready? Okay. What's Romans about? Can you teach me the message of cognitive Romans when I stand on one leg? Shall I try that? There you go. Chapter... No, I'm, I'm tired and dizzy. Romans 1. The Gentiles sin without the law. But they've got their conscience and they know it's sin. Chapter 2 of Romans, the Jews sin with the law. They've got the law that tells them that that is sin. So what's the difference, chapter 3? Well, no difference in this respect. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified freely by His grace, by the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. There's the, there's the big headline for Romans. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are put right with God simply by the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. Jew, Gentile, everybody, that comes everybody in the world. We've sinned, we know it, secretly. We make all sorts of excuses, but actually God has done this. St. Christ Jesus, redemption. Right? Whoa, you can't say a thing like that. And, you know, this happens all the time, doesn't it? Preachers say things and people get up in arms about it. Well, imagine Paul saying that, writing that in that book, and it's read out in the church in Rome, and all of a sudden he anticipates there's going to be objections all around the room. And the first objection is, you can't say that about us. We are sons of Abraham. First Jewish objection. We are sons of Abraham. You can't say that about us. And so chapters 4 and 5 of Romans are dealing with that. Abraham is the father of the faithful. And if, if you're his child, you'll be trusting him to be brought right with, him, with God by grace through faith alone. That's how Abraham is put right with God. Chapters 4 and 5 says that. Another objection in another corner of the room. You can't say things like that. And this is the voice of experience, right? You can't say things like that because people will just misbehave if you tell them it's all free grace. <coughs> you can't say that. So in chapter 6, 7, and 8, Paul deals with that objection. He says, well, when you actually become a Christian, when you actually trust Jesus to do it all for you, what happens is he puts his Holy Spirit in your heart. And that Holy Spirit in you cleans up your act a lot. And you, together with the Spirit, if you, by the Spirit, put to death the desires of your flesh, you will live. There's a good memory verse. Do you do memory verses? Yeah? I think we're going to is it? <laughs> Romans 8, 13, right? If oh, it's going to be the authorised version. Can you, can you cope with that? It's kind of tumbling out of my head in the King James. Hang on a minute. Um, if you, by the Spirit, put to death the desires of your flesh, you will live. You will be amongst the living <coughs> You, by the Spirit. You're not on your own in this. There's the first objection. You can't say that with sons of Abraham. There's the second objection. You can't say that because if you say that to people, they'll just go and live as they like because they think salvation's free. Next objection. That means God's unfaithful to the Jews, then. Chapters 9 through 11. What's the response to that? No, God isn't being unfaithful to the faithful. God is approaching a bush that was planted in order to bear fruit, a vine. Should have been given, you know, tasty grapes and nice drinking juice. Right? And he comes to that vine and he finds a lot of those branches are no longer in him. They're not trusting in him. They're not bearing fruit in him. They're not drawing on the sap and producing his fruit. And so they're pruned. They're not living branches that he's taking off, they're dead branches that he's taking off. And he's grafting in fresh stuff onto that same root stuff. It's not that he's been unfaithful. It's that there are those who've been unfaithful to him. And been pruned out. 
and blood has been brought and, and grafted in that rootstock. And you know about that because could you know about your viticulture in ancient Israel? You know about that stuff. So there's this proposition. All have sinned, whether they got the law or not, and fall short of the glory of God, and are put right with God by grace through faith alone. The redemption that came through Christ Jesus. And then there's the objections. And he's dealt with the actual objections he anticipates people will have. There's a parallel for what we're trying to do in this series. And now in chapter 12, he has spent what's three, what's three off? You know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. He spent eight chapters dealing with their little objections that will be underlying everything he's saying. And now he comes back to the point. And he says, therefore, in view of this mercy of God. And in view of his consistent behaviour and character, in view of all of that, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What he's done is wonderful. Worship him. And that's a change. That's the fundamental change that God is looking for from any human being. Start worshiping this great, this glorious, this amazing God. Be amazed. Be amazed by him. Now, of course, the form those people's objections take will be different from the form that objections take in our day and age. But on the merit, on the basis of his unconditional, unmerited favour, served up free to those who trust in Jesus, come on into this fundamental change in life direction, says Paul. Live out that golden therefore. <laughs> Worship this God. So that's what the therefore is there for. That's what inspires what the Bible is asking for from you. And what the Bible is asking for from you is worship. Go and watch that when we say that to people. Because when we say that to people, what they think is what? When we ask them for worship. To worship God. They easily think that these? A, a suit? And a big scary looking building? Uh, it's cold and damp, and the seats are really rough, you know? Uh, and somebody up the front. Yeah? That's also oh, your yeah. impression of a duck. And, and my impression of a duck. It was a bit like a duck, wasn't it? Well, there you go. Draw your own conclusions. And then, uh, and then you know, stuff from the previous age. Yeah. And if kids misbehave, there's a loud tutting noise from somewhere. Yeah, like that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, am I misbehaving? Uh, oh, well, the sweetie gets passed along the road, you know? The ones that stuck to the packet, you know, the ones that have been there for ages. <coughs> That's what they think worship is, it's not, is it? Fundamental, deep-seated, heart, appreciation of the goodness and the mercy of God, <coughs> rejoicing in Him. Yeah? They won't necessarily get that when you ask for worship. That might need to be explained. Worship, what is it? What does it do? What is worship? Music? Worship in some sectors is having funky tunes in church on a Sunday. Sorry, can't, can't do that. Uh, we got what we got, yeah? Singing? Oh, I love the singing. That's not some worship, is it? Paul, what, what was it? Swaying about a bit, you know? Hands up, hands down, you know, people require different things. Full on bopping around the room. Been there, and that, interesting. What are we talking about, Paul? We're talking about worship. What does he say? Present your body. Your earthly <coughs> existence as you live it out as a living sacrifice to God. There's your worship. There's your worship. Never mind me grabbing every ounce of my life, which ends soon enough and you want to get the one. Making sure I enjoy every bit of that life for myself to the full. Never mind that. Put that aside. Yeah, I've only got the one life. Just like he did. The one life he had. And he laid that precious life down in sacrifice for me. Because I had messed things around a bit. Messed them up. And my life's nothing like as good as the one he laid down for me. But if he wants it, he can have it. Because of all he's laid down for me, that's worship. Says Paul. That's worship, he can have it. Take my life, let it be. So here I'm going to forget it. Consecrated Lord to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless play. Here's an old hymn. Do you have one? Yeah. So it's there. 
That's worship. <clears throat> that, my friends, that is the appropriate worship response to the things that we're all about. The grace of God in the gospel for utterly undeserving rebels, failures, and sinners. Me. Glad worship. Glad. Grateful. Grateful. Not worship extorted, but worship that bursts through. What is it that transforms our thinking to the extent that we worship God gladly like that? We come to understand the unmerited favour and love from God towards us that, that Paul is setting out in the preceding chapters. Okay then, that's what it is. It's coming to understand the love that we want for somebody to love us in spite of what we're like. So here's this human desire, this deep human Hunger to be loved in spite of what we're like, and it's so much time hiding away what we're actually like, so people won't see, so they might possibly like us. And here's the key to it the acknowledgement, the confession, and the kind of words. But the love of God to me is amazing. Get this. Um, hallelujah. <laughs> so, what is the life change which springs from this appreciation of being unconditionally loved? What does that life change amount to? What does it do? We've looked at the fundamental change. It's a change to worship. What are the new priorities? Verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then something will follow from that. You'll be able to... Test and approve what God's will is. It's good, pleasing, perfect will. Do not conform. Um, it's Glastonbury this week. Have you noticed? Yeah, Cumbi is empty. <laughs> Everybody's gone. Right? Tiki Valley is deserted. Then in Glastonbury, Cumbi is empty. This week I spoke to someone in the shop in the village who uh, is performing at Glastonbury. I thought I'd slip that in. I have to slip it in somewhere, didn't I? Um, but I spoke to someone who's performing at Glastonbury this week. And, uh, you know, I mean something, because when I grew up, all these festivals were a big deal, perhaps more than they are today, uh, and they were, they were all about non-conformity, non-conformity, they were all about not conforming, they were all about kicking over and all, some of you were smiling with fond memories of the backs of your minds. This is what it looked like for those who weren't around at the time, for well, some of it is. Um, this is sort of the 70s, in, in quick, quick cameo on the wall. Um, you know, it's all about non-conformity, and there's those guys there running around in their underpants in the mud in Glastonbury, uh, you know, just throw off all restraint kind of thing. I had to look hard to find a photo that had underpants. Um, there's this one here, you know, grow your hair, that was a big number. Do you remember growing hair? I remember friends of mine who were growing their hair, and their fathers would got so disgusted, and all their friends at work were <coughs> such jibbing out there boys looking like girls that they'd pin them down in the living room and cut their locks off, you know, <laughs> and disgust at this rebellion, this non-conformity, not conforming. And there was all this psychedelic stuff. Do you remember that with the headbands and the big ties and the funny flary trousers and the platform boats? And my Afghan coat ended up going under somebody's dog. Um, <laughs> at the end of this useful life. Oh, yeah. And that against the background, a rebellion against, you know, this is a 1970s businessman with his suit and his tie looking tidy. You were talking about your scooter, you know, mods, rockers. There you go. It was all about. Not conforming, but it was a terribly conformist way of not conforming because there was the uniform and there was the pattern of behaviour and there was the expectations. Paul is saying, don't be conformed. The call to follow Christ is a call not to just go with the flow and drift along with the way everything happens in this world. To think what it tells you and to do as it requires of you. Simply because you have been so loved as you are. You don't idolise the opinion formers of this passing age, but you worship the God of the ages who loved you like this. And instead of being poured into this world's mould, you follow him. Because he's everything to you. He's amazing. What does conformed mean? Anybody? Conformed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to agree, yeah. 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 Con is kind of with in this context. And formed is, you know, shape, made. Yeah. Yeah, cool. 
So, so the Cambridge Online Dictionary, to which I had resort, uh, says this, to behave according to the usual standards of behaviour that are expected by a group or society. To behave according to their standards expected of you. It's like uh, concrete and formwork. You know, you put up shuttering, yeah, for a wall or, you know, certainly where, where Ben is, they, they make houses, they make flats, huge blocks of flats like this. They just put in the scaffold and they put in the shuttering and they pour the concrete for the student into a mould, in situ. You pour this wet, formless stuff in and you pack it down a bit and it sets in a shape. It's set there. Don't get set by this passing away world into a shape that will pass away with it, writes Paul. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Do you know what transformers are, they? Yeah. Yeah? Oh, they're awake, man. Look. Hello. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's it, isn't it? Transformers, you take something, right, that's metal, some metal object, and you change that metal object, that metal object changes itself, doesn't it, into completely another, much more effective one. That's what happens. So is that. That's Ratchet. Yeah. Jim, that's Ratchet on there, that is. It used to be that truck, and he becomes this sort of, you know, transforms into this. Girls are really thrilled with this, they're just going along with all of this. You get a change in style, you get a transformation. Right? Not all change is bad or unwelcome, is it? You can change your form, you can change your shape, and therefore abilities and purpose, what you do, what you can do, changing it. That's what it's all about here. Not all change is bad or unwelcome, is it? Changing the style of transformation and not conforming, arising out of aspiring to something utterly and completely better than what you are or what you have at the moment. That's what Paul's looking for. Different kettle of fish. <laughs> That's growing into realising your potential. You don't want to change? You just want to be loved as you are? You have been loved as you are. So don't conform to this old world stuff anymore, but be transformed. How are you going to be transformed? How do you want to be transformed? I want to be transformed, says Paul, by the renewing of your mind. This isn't going to hurt. Your mind is going to be renewed. So you want to aspire to the changes that God's looking for. Renewed thinking is at the bottom of all of it. There's this verse in the Psalms. You know this verse in the Psalms, Psalm 47, isn't it? Verse 4? Ooh, struggling. Um, delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. So there we go, being the sort of people we are. We say, oh, I just got to delight myself in God, and He'll give me what I'm asking for. Is that what it means? Maybe that's what it means. Maybe we delight ourselves in God, and we're praying this way, and then God says, here's the desire. Or maybe, <clears throat> maybe we delight in ourselves in God and the desires of our heart are going to be different because He's going to give us new desires in our heart. We need thinking. That's why Bible teaching is so important because we come to rub our mind against the mind of God and something rubs off. It's important. Fellowship with people who are also working on thinking biblically for themselves rather than just conforming to the thoughts and the lifestyle and the standards for aspiration and behaviour of the mould that this world would force them into. It's all about the way you come to think and learn to think as the extent of the unmerited love and favour of God towards you sinks into your mind. The change that Jesus seeks to bring about is incentivised by his love, is driven by his love, comes about through the change of mind that knowing and growing in his love brings about. And it's something those who know his love willingly and heartily embrace. Because he's giving a new mind. We are not talking about religion. We are talking about life-changing relationship with the living, loving God who's loved us the way we know we want to be loved. And we need to keep on with people. The Christian transformation takes place not from the outside in, but from the inside out. As we are granted forgiveness of sin, given a new heart, develop a new mind, and as those things develop in us a transformed way of thinking and living. Because most people's objections to what they see as being Christian arise because that's not what's understood or practiced. 
That's not what people are saying is Christianity to them all the time. Most people's objections seem to arise either out of these two things they see about God, or what they see as the church, and we'll be looking at that over the next three weeks all day long. For the time being, please notice this is what was prophesied in the Old Testament, new heart and new mind. This is New Testament faith and New Testament Christianity, and you read about it in the Acts of the Apostles. This is the real deal, life-changing stuff that Jesus is about. Not some enforced external code of rules and regulations, but the refusal to conform to this world's mould. The desire to be transformed in view of the unmerited favour of God towards me, a sinner. And the renewed mind that follows on from hearing God's word, taking it to heart, walking with this personal God who's loved me to this extreme and undeserved degree. That's the all. Enough, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's nearly all. Not quite. Because that's where the peace and the harmony and the well being and the shalom comes from. Your renewed mind attunes you not actually to the universe, you know, like 70 zippies, um, just. Uh, Want to be a bubble finally merging into the cosmic sea, man? You know what's that? Too young. Too That renewed mind attunes me to the ways not of the universe, but of the Creator of the universe. It attunes me to God's ways, not just at peace in the creation, but at one with the Creator of the all, who makes it run. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's way really is. He's good, pleasing, and perfect. Will. So but now you're thinking of your chicken in the oven, and uh, where's the conclusion going? Yeah? Here's the conclusion. The Gospel calls us to repentance and faith, right? <coughs> it does. Jesus goes out in Galilee at the beginning of his preaching ministry. What does he preach? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You can do that because they know what the kingdom of God's all about. They've read the New their Old Testament and they've had the background. They know what it's about. Our people don't. No idea. So we go out and ask them to repent like that. I don't know what this is all about. What's, oh, whoa, this, that is where this objection comes from. That is where people start saying, I want you to love me as I am, but you want me to change. I don't feel safe. As Christians, we've got to be wise to that. How do you help a man with a broken leg? Do you help a man with a broken leg to walk by marching up to him, kicking his crutches straight away from under him? You don't. You take him to physio. So often as Christians we can make this mistake, we're walking up to people who are hurting and broken. And they know they need a saviour, but they've never heard of him, they don't know what it's about. And all they hear from us is, change yourself! It's like kicking the crutches out from under a guy who really needs some physio before we get to that. It'll come to that, but he needs some physio first. Paul has spent 11 whole chapters of Romans so far spelling out the situation with the unmerited favour of God and encouraging and strengthening these people in those 8 chapters from chapter 3 on 4 onwards. Strengthening and encouraging those people in the gospel truth and, and patiently discussing with them their problems and their issues and their objections and, and so on before ever getting to the crucial appeal he makes at the beginning of chapter 12. So how do we address this? often hidden objection that people have and they come at us and talk about what you might say last week, UFOs or something, wouldn't it? People come up with the strangest things to evade the gospel, don't they? And the implications of Christ, you know? What's underneath all that? Well, it may be this one. Do you want me to change? Do I just want to be loved, please? I'm hurting? I don't feel safe with the change you're talking about? What do we say? Well, you have been. Let's talk about it. You have been loved like that. Let's talk about that. It's tremendous. Understand about this Jesus. Understand the extent to which he's gone for you. Understand he did this on the basis of nothing that was good that was already in you. It came free. Understand that God meant nothing bad for you or anyone else in all of this. He's not here to hurt you. Understand the way this world seeks to pour and set and solidify you in its own fundamentally, fatally flawed mould. And rebel against that. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Get that brain food of God's word into your thinking and walk away from the anaesthetics of this world's tempting little fixes, temporary fixes. Trouble anaesthetic is it wears off, right? Eh? 
Mm. And I'm alright here. Walk with the creator of the universe, who walks with you in his garden, discussing his ways with you in the cool of the day. That's the call of Christ, isn't it? That's the call of Christ. That's the message of this gospel. We're not representing it like that. And the question has to be, why on earth? Because it's creating an objection that's really keeping people from Christ. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your rational, reasonable, what does that word mean? Appropriate act of worship. Do you know what? It's good. It's great. And there's nothing to be afraid of there at all. Given the way that he has loved us. And given himself for us. Amen. Amen. Nothing fancy, nothing fake. Nothing wasted and no deal to make. What you